maybe we can start the discussion um, through the lens of preventive care. The only thing I know is wearing sunscreen is a net positive. I, I understand enough to say that UV damages skin. Um, is it damaging elastin? Is it damaging collagen? Or is it purely just these sunspots that it creates? What is it that sun is doing that is damaging? Quite a bit. Okay. So um, I'm glad you mentioned sunscreen because if anyone's going to come in and say, what's the absolute minimum thing I should use on my skin every day, it would be sunscreen. And in fact, there was a four-year study out of Australia that followed people for four years and either they wore sunscreen or they didn't. And the ones that did aged better. Was it randomized? It was randomized. Okay, good. So it aged better. They aged better. Fewer lines, fewer wrinkles. And that's in a country that has a lot of sun. Yep. So that shows you the power of using sunscreen. Now, I'll take it a step further. I tell my patients they have to use mineral sunscreens as opposed to chemical sunscreens because I'm not convinced of the safety of avobenzone, oxybenzone as hormone disruptors. I do think there are some uh, science, scientific studies that suggest maybe they play a role in infertility. You can measure them in the bloodstream, mm -hmm. especially if you're putting them over the entire body. Yep. The body, the skin is a great portal for chemicals to enter into the bloodstream if it's the right size chemical. So there have been already studies done that show a huge spike in the amount of these in your bloodstream after application. After saying this for 15 years, I think the FDA just a couple of weeks ago finally told the companies they must do animal safety studies. It's about time. It's so very the, late. Yeah, so late yeah, in the game. It's very late. Because and also, the, I'm sorry to interrupt, but just I'm, I'm so on board with you about the problems with uh, chemical sunscreens because the other problem it creates is that patients think they're covered mm -hmm. and then the chemicals that are actually protecting against the UV damage become inactivated over time. And you don't know- Because you still have the film on you. You yes. have the film on you, and you don't know at what time of day you no longer have any solar protection. And it's within the... an hour. It's within yeah. an hour. You put a sunscreen SPF 70 on, go outside, and it's going to be, if it's strong sun, yep. it's going to be deactivated within an hour. People will burn on mm -hmm. SPF 70, SPF 100. There should be nothing above a SPF 50 mineral because you can't get it into a formula. What, what is the expect. use case for the chemical sunscreen? Are they less expensive? Like what oh. are they water? Like what was the rationale for them? They blend in. They blend in very easily. So the people love it because there's no white film when they put it on. Hmm. A mineral sunscreen takes a little bit more work to blend it in or it's going to cost more because you're going to have to get a micronized or a micronized formula of zinc oxide or titanium dioxide. So my Elta MD 30 to 50, I think I have one of each. I'm pretty sure that's a mineral sunscreen. It's you have to work to put it in, yeah. right? Is that that's... yes? And some of them, um, Elta makes some mineral and some mm -hmm. uh, chemical ones. So just double check. Got it. Okay. And they make it confusing on purpose, by the way. So you have to go out of your way to actually find formulas that are primarily mineral, because the companies want to sell you both products, and they know that customer satisfaction is higher with is chemical. higher with chemical. And you know, this doesn't have anything to do with this this conversation specifically, but. Susan has created skincare and so have I created skincare. So we've we've really dived into this world of skincare. And the marketing of skincare um, can really mislead consumers. And uh, companies that are creating skincare are motivated by sales. They want people to be happy with their SPF. When it's a chemical sunscreen, they're going to be happier with it because it doesn't have that white pasty effect. But it's just not as effective. Got it. And the other thing that happens, if you look at the amount of skin cancer in the U.S., it's increasing, including melanoma. So why do we have generations now of people from the late 90s on up who say they use sunscreen all the time and our skin cancer rates are going up? I think it's twofold. I think it's because, A, like you said, Tanuj, the sunscreens degrade very quickly when they put on a chemical sunscreen. And I'm going to take it one step further. When those chemical sunscreens absorb those harmful rays, whether it's UVB or UVA, the cells, uh, the, well, the chemicals absorb them and they neutralize those rays, but they cause reactive oxygen species. And those reactive oxygen species damage the DNA of the cells, which then accentuates the damage that you're getting from whatever other UVA gets through the sunscreen. So you're really causing more damage and probably causing these cells to become more atypical. 
atypical over time. By the way, you know that there's a there's a group of people who argue that, and I don't agree with this at all, that, that argue that sun and UV rays have no causal role in melanoma. And the, the argument they put forth is sunscreen use has been increasing and yet we see a significant increase in the incidence of melanoma. So they're pointing at the same observation. They're offering a different argument. I yeah. find your argument far more compelling. Yeah. I think everyone should be using a mineral sunscreen. So that's number one. Okay. Uh, to your point, we could spend the rest of the podcast on it. We won't. We've established the fact that step one, the no regret move, protect your skin in the sun. Um, what's the next level thing that one can do for prevention? So we may be on the same line. We might be a little bit different. I would say step two would be a retinoid of some sort. And it could be in your- I was earth. worried you were going to say that. I know. Everyone <laughs> says just that. just one more thing they... <laughs> I have to apply. Well, here's what I tell patients, because you said you don't wash your face at night, right? I know. Don't, I, do it's you so brush, gross. Do you brush your teeth at night? I do. I'm a okay. religious right, flosser and teeth brusher. Right next to your toothbrush, put your little tube of retinoid. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I tell my patients. The few times I tried to use this, like I couldn't do it every day. It just got me too red. Did that mean I was on too high a formulation? I should have gone back to the aldehyde. I was too young. I probably tried this 10 years ago and never did it again. So I have, a, I take a different approach than even most of my colleagues. I tell people if they're trying to achieve a goal, whether it's treating melasma, sun damage, or they're getting ready for a, a child's wedding, or we have to do a procedure, I would tell them to tough it out. Because if you use that retinoic acid every single day, your body acclimates to it very quickly. It may take six weeks, seven weeks, eight weeks, but you get your skin used to it, and then you reap all the benefits. But some patients are always going to quit. So from that standpoint, then- I'm a quitter. Yeah. So we would give you five days a week retinaldehyde, two days a week retinoic acid, and tell you to start that way. And then maybe as your skin acclimates to it, you can change that proportion. Okay. And by the way, do you become more light sensitive when you take this? Do you? Does it make you- does it make it even more important that you're wearing sunscreen in the sun? So those studies came out very early on, which is why people start to say, oh, I stopped my retinoid in the summer. And that's the last thing you should do. Because initially when you start a retinoid, you will get exfoliation at the level of the dead layer of the skin, the stratum yep. corneum. But after you've been on the retinoid for a long time, that builds back up. So you, you become less light sensitive. You might always still be a little bit, but you're a lot less light sensitive than when you first start a retinoid. But you okay. should always have a sunscreen on yep. and a hat. And retinoids have been shown that if, even if you get sun exposure, they have the ability to repair some of that DNA damage early on. So you really want to be on a retinoid all the time. I was going to also add, um, you know, when people are thinking about the core aspects of what should they be using on their skin now that they're starting to notice some changes in their 20s or 30s, um, in addition to sunscreen and retinoids. Um, I think that vitamin C is a really important molecule to get onto the skin also. Tried that too. Let me tell you why I stopped. It was mixed with like ferric acid. Ferulic acid. Yes, yes. yes. And it stunk. Yes. Yeah, I just hated the smell of it. And the reason for that is because vitamin C is a notoriously complicated, easily reduced molecule. Mm -hmm. And when manufacturers are formulating their vitamin C serums, it, it'll, it might be a year from when it leaves the factory and gets onto your skin, if we're lucky. Um, and in that year, all of the relatively inexpensive vitamin C serums are going to degrade and not actually have any bioavailability when that vitamin C is applied to the skin. And so the relatively more expensive formulations are being produced by manufacturers that are doing all sorts of manufacturing flips and tricks to try and stabilize that vitamin C. The, the uh, product you're talking about, which I, I, I think I can probably guess, um, uh, is uh, it, they, they use the ferulic acid to stabilize the vitamin C so that it maintains its bioavailability. Other formulations of vitamin C will use um, you know, an oil-based formula. It's not aqueous because then uh, the vitamin C is much less likely to be reduced in, in that kind of formulation. But those products tend to be petroleum oil based and also have all sorts of negatives associated with it. And then there are some products that will micro encapsulate or find other creative ways 
of making sure that the vitamin C is actually bioavailable when it hits your skin. So I, that product may have not worked for you, but there are other there are options others. to find a stable vitamin C. And, and this is one of those products where, you know, again, we have our own, you know, custom formulas, but I'll tell people who are price sensitive, go to Walgreens, buy a retinoid, buy a sunscreen. You don't need to spend more than 10 or $15 on effective products. Um, you know, but vitamin C is something where you have to spend the money on it. And because, by the way, what yeah. retinoid can you buy at Walmart? Retinol and you, some you, retinol. That I has. see. But you can't yeah. get retinoic acid no, without that's a, prescription. a prescription. Right. Got it. Right. And is there any downside of using retinol or do you just need a lot more of it to no. make sure you get... The problem is if you try to push that enzymatic chain reaction, yep. you'll get a der dermatitis. Are you putting this on like all over your face like this, even over my beard and stuff? So I always tell them, hold up your finger mm. and it should be from the tip of your index finger to your DIP joint. Oh my God. And that's how, a fingertip <laughs> unit. And if you can do a fingertip unit of retinoid every night, that's a great way to measure that you're getting enough on. And I can see your face. You and can see I'm getting a troponin leak right now, <laughs> just thinking about applying that much stuff. Yeah, and I have them put, put it on their face, including the under eye area, because that's the thinnest skin. Yep. And that's the skin that's going to wrinkle and age first. So most people are afraid to go around their eyes. And mm -hmm. Um, I would tell them, just don't get it in your eyes. Go <laughs> go around, but make sure you're getting that under eye area. Once a week, maybe, on the upper eyelid. And then once or twice a week on the neck, because again, this is the thinnest skin. We've got to keep that skin building collagen and elastin. Okay. The vitamin C and ferlic acid, would you put that on after? First. So you always put the liquid Okay. Before the thickest stuff. So okay. you so go you, thinnest you, to thickest. Okay. And, and you know, maybe it's worth also mentioning, because we haven't done this yet, you know, why is vitamin C so important? Um, I assume it has to do yeah. with proline and collagen? That's one aspect. So vitamin C is, is sort of like a wonder molecule when it comes to facial aesthetics, because... Yes, it is a precursor for the collagen synthesis pathway um, in, in the proline um, synthesis pathway, but it also is a powerful antioxidant. And so antioxidant application to the skin not only has the power to um, remove injury, oxidative injury that has happened during the day, but it also has the ability to reverse some existing damage that's in place. Um, vitamin C also regulates the tyrosine kinase pathway, which is sort of a, a, a scientific way of saying that complexion, which is, you know, people talk about wanting to have good complexion. What does that mean? Complexion is something that across societies, no matter what your Fitzpatrick scale is, people like to have a good complexion. And that means having an even skin tone, yeah. which is even distribution of melanin. It doesn't matter if you're black or white or brown, you want to have people desire to have their skin look even without splotchy areas of pigmentation or nearby areas of relative depigmentation. And so regulating the tyrosine kinase pathway so that there's an even production of melanin throughout the skin is something that is valuable, very valuable in an aesthetic sense. And that's something that vitamin C does as well. And then it sounds like the last thing you said we want to do is uh, as a, as a, a moisturizer. Yes. Is that fair? Okay. Yeah, I would say the cheapest trick in skincare, which actually is is really true, is that deep moisturization locks down the skin barrier function and allows the skin turgor of the skin, dermis, epithelium to thicken just by having that occlusive barrier. So you can go to Walgreens and spend $6 on Aquaphor, which is basically petroleum jelly, yeah. and put it on your face nightly, and your skin will look better in 30 days, guaranteed. Because your skin will thicken, and a lot of the fine lines and crinkles will actually start to disappear because your skin is being more hydrated. That's hydration. That's hydration. That's hydration. Yeah, but, it's, yeah. Uh, but what I'm if I don't want to grease up my pillow? Yeah, I'm, not, yeah. I, I'm, yeah. I'm saying that as sort of like tongue in cheek. I, got it, got I, it. I, I'm not telling people to do that. Okay. But um, if, you, if you actually did a double-blinded study, you would see that there All are real equal. results yeah. in 30 yep. days. But the reason why I mentioned that is that um, good, deep hydration can be performed with an inexpensive product that you're using regularly, and it'll make a real difference because the moisturization, especially overnight while you're sleeping, is a powerful tool for aesthetics. And, you know, yeah. I don't, I, like, I wouldn't give you, though, a moisturizer. 
So it, you can just tell I'm a grease ball to begin with. <laughs> no, you have young, thicker skin. So again, just like uh, women age 20 years faster than guys in terms of the bone remodeling and fat atrophy, the skin as well. So you say I, my my routine would be done after the retinoic acid. From from my standpoint, yes. At this point, and then we exactly. might revisit that in a few years. Yeah. Okay. So just to go through this, because I'm you can tell not the sharpest tool in the shed. My AM routine is going to be wash. Okay, let's assume I just came out of the shower. All right. Okay. Uh, S- your serum. serum. And, and so by the like way, in the shower, acid. don't use your body soap on your face because Correct. it's going to strip the oils out of your face. So again, you need a separate facial cleanser. Oh, God. What what do I need? The same glycerol-based thing? Well, it depends on your skin type, too. Like I, I tend to be maybe a little bit more... Picky about I mean, if you, you're you, if you saw the crap that I like, I'm I've got like a two ninety nine bottle body wash from Target that I scrub head to toe. Like, I am the lowest comment. Like, the, put it this way: when my wife met me in the hospital, the first thing she noticed was how disgusting I was. In that, I used to take alcohol pads and clean my face. Like just like that was my shower in the hospital. That probably She's wasn't like, bad. It was a little harsh, but it probably I mean, wasn't bad. Like, there were worse things you could do. All right, so we're gonna do we're gonna do soap. <laughs> yeah. We're gonna do serum. Yes. And then we're gonna do sunscreen. Yes. That's the morning routine. And some people might in there need, depending on if they have clogged pores, oilier skin, they might need a alpha hydroxy acid or polyhydroxy acid before their sunscreen. But you've nailed it right there. That's a very simple regimen you can follow. Okay, and then the PM is soap, serum. We'd prefer if you call it a cleanser, right? Yes. Because soap, uh, soap op- kind of opens takes up a the door harsh. to the yeah. Target 299 yeah, stuff. Fair yeah, fair enough. Glycerol. <laughs> and now the difference is, you know, I do have lots of patients like you, Peter, who are minimalists. So again, it's trying to get them to use whatever they can to protect their skin and hopefully start to improve the aging process. All right, I might, I might, just to do the experiment for 90 days, try to commit to cleanser, serum, sunscreen in the morning, cleanser, serum, retinoic acid in the evening. That, we agree that would be? Yes. Okay. By the way, in the show notes, we'll get from you products that you guys like, including your own. I just want to let people kind of look through this and decide. And, and you know, obviously you guys disclose your own products. Great. But let, let people see the full breadth of things. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I'm... And I'm sorry. And one of the things people ask about, though, especially when they're very into their nutrition and eating healthy, they say, well, why do I need to apply an antioxidant if I'm eating a lot of antioxidants? Sure. And the skin being the largest organ in your body is very unique. It's very good at keeping things out or from the inside coming out as well. So outside things like water, pollution, it tries to pr- protect that from getting in and does a good job at keeping kind of homeostasis. So they have shown that the level of vitamin C that you can achieve in the skin by topical application far exceeds what you can do by ingesting it. The amount you would have to ingest sure. to get the right amount in the skin, you'd have GI issues, <laughs> which yeah. that, that would definitely make you quit. I'm Peter Atia. This podcast relies exclusively on premium subscribers for support, which allows us to provide all our content without taking a single penny from advertisers. I believe this keeps my content honest, making it a trusted resource for listeners like you. As a premium member, you'll get immediate access to our entire back catalog of AMA episodes and all future AMA episodes. You'll get longevity-focused premium articles packed with actionable insights, You'll get unrivaled show notes for each and every episode of The Drive, every topic, every study, every resource from each episode carefully curated for you. You'll get quarterly podcast summaries where you'll learn my biggest personal takeaways from the previous 90 days of expert guest episodes and much more. This journey doesn't have to be navigated alone. We can take these steps towards a better, longer life together. Become a premium member today at peteratiamd.com forward slash subscribe to join me in a shared commitment to a healthier future.